To the first talk of the day, Matthias Varas is going to teach us uh, to manage the understandability of our systems through bounded contexts. Enjoy. Thanks. So yes, I'm Matthias Varas uh, from Belgium. Uh, I work at a place called Artling. We help organizations do domain modeling, software design strategy, um, software design in general, uh, coaching as well, training. Uh, we also organize uh, Domain Driven Design Europe, the other conference uh, in uh, Amsterdam next year in, uh, in May. Um, I have some bad news. This was supposed to be a duo presentation with my colleague, Hien Verschatze. She had this really great example from a client where she worked um, on uh, DNA sequencing uh, of cannabinoids. They had robots, but you're not getting that far today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the good news is I will be talking about uh, tax calculation and warehouses and trade. OK, the good news is you can see her stuff uh, probably on YouTube soon. NDC has a recording. <laughs> so have you worked on a system that's hard to understand? Don't, don't raise your hands. I know it's all of you. It's, uh, it's like a, we, we seem to accept this in our industry, and that uh, bothers me. So let's go straight into a very simple example just to warm you up in the sort of thing I'm talking about. Uh, of course, you all probably know about abstraction and, and these kind of things. So here's a simple example. There's a tax calculator. We have a few different uh, implementations. And they work by um, defining a set of calculation rules that have to be handled in a certain order. This is, of course, a very simplified uh, model. And so to solve this, what the developer had done is add in an abstract calculator in between and move the logic there for handling the priority of these rules. So you can add rules and, and, uh, with a priority and then uh, get the next rule. So basically, the, the individual implementations don't have to worry about this responsibility, which is you know, not a bad uh, improvement, of course. Um, but I feel it's a missed opportunity, right? The, the simple um, principle you could apply here is composition over inheritance. Can we move this out and, and compose this or use this in some way? And of course we can, right? This is, uh, we can just take all that logic from that abstract class, put it in a, something called a rule stack, and now all the responsibility for managing the order of the rules, etc., cetera, is, uh, is, is uh, separated out. Um, so normally I might stop here. Very often I would because I, there might not be added value in refactoring this further. Um, I'm not in favor of going as generic as possible. I've been in the Haskell space. If you've been there, they go to extreme lengths to make everything as, extreme as, uh, as generic as possible. Uh, but here for the example, I will do it, because um, you could actually, I think I swapped two slides. Oh, no, it's fine. So if you take out the rule concept from that stack object and make that generic, now you have just a generic stack of anything, right? Uh, as I said, I don't think in this particular example there would be a lot of benefit, but it helps to serve, illustrate that really what we've done is separated something that doesn't have to be in the original bounded context anymore. This management of anything in an order is now a completely separate responsibility or, or context of uh, tax calculation has become smaller and easier to understand. It's really focusing on the domain concepts. Right? So that's sort of the benefit here. And, and we're doing this here at a very small sort of object level, but I want to talk about this at, at the larger scale of bounded context, of course. Uh, but this is probably stuff you know, bad abstractions, they leak details, there's no sort of general organizing principles of what goes where and why it goes there, etc. Puts the burden on the reader, and as you probably know, there's a lot of research that shows that most of our time is spent reading code. Right? That's why I think under understandability of software has been so much uh, uh, underestimated. Uh, the importance of it. Um, well, people talk about readability, but I think it's a bit more than that. Right? It's not just reading code; it's understanding the system as a whole, or at least parts of the system that you're that you're working on. Uh, having that understandability makes software development a lot faster and cheaper and safer as well, because you're less likely to make mistakes. 
Of course, good abstraction isolates a problem from other problems. So we're used to talking about this at sort of local software design level, at object level. With bounded context, we can talk about this at a much larger scale. And it's not just code. When we talk about bounded context, we talk about language, right? Ubiquitous language, models, the conceptual understanding of how our system works. We're trying to isolate responsibilities there. Yes? Make sense? This early in the morning? All right. So um, I feel that even in the DDD community, right, most of us are sort of um, undervaluing the difference between domains and bounded context. Domains, I see that as it's from the problem space, right? It's how the business perceives itself, how the business organizes itself, how it thinks about itself, right? Oh, we are, you know, uh, um, a company that does uh, textile distribution, just that's our, our main domain, and then our core domain, and then part of, parts of that are subdomains, so we do, you know, we do invoices, we do this, we do that. That's sort of how they perceive themselves. They have organized themselves. Part of it is historic, right? We have historically, people have separated sales from marketing for practical reasons, for organizational purposes or engineering from marketing, or all these, these kind of separations exist because organizations have sort of evolved this, and these are patterns that seem to work, or that they copy blindly. Uh, other times they have separated you know, deliberately themselves. But the way organizations organize is to serve their needs, not how to organize the software, right? They haven't designed themselves over the last like four or 500 years uh, in ways that serve the software. Uh, we as designers, developers, designers are used in a broad sense, everybody who has an impact on the design of the software system. So bounded contexts are solution space, are our way or a tool for us to organize the software and to think about how it works. And I'm not talking here about system boundaries. We have been doing that since you know the 70s, uh, Parnas. Uh, the modularization of, of software systems. Um, uh, I'm not talking about domains. I'm talking about something different here. That's bounded context. Right? So this is a tool that we have. The bounded contexts are not inherent in the domain, in the problem space. It's what we choose. Right? That gives us opportunities. Right? We can choose this to make it work for us and for the business. So roughly, um, there's more definitions, but for now, a bounded context as a set of domain concepts, uh, language, the, the model inside of it, the abstractions inside of it, that makes up the bounded context. So it's sort of, it's, it's intangible, right? It's not like a physical system, it's not a service, it's not a deployable unit. It can be, but a bounded context can be spread across multiple, bounded, uh, multiple services, multiple apps, or a single app, like a monolith, could have multiple bounded contexts inside, at least if it's sort of a modular monolith. It's the, it's the set of concepts that we want to understand together, that we need to understand together. Right? Can I understand this thing without having to understand this other thing? That makes it a good candidate for a separation of bounded context. Ideally, you can... Like the industry average for bringing a new developer into uh, a team or, or into an organization for them to become productive is like six months. That's very long. If we have smaller understandability boundaries, we can speed that up a lot more. Right? They only have to understand these. They have. They can understand. I know the, the the payment context without having to understand the invoicing context. That's a very healthy separation. Then. So and of course within that bounded context, we strive for a coherent model. Everything is consistent, the rules, the language is sort of self-consistent. We're not guaranteeing that consistency outside to other bounded contexts. So a concept may have a definition here, may have an entirely different definition elsewhere. Right? We can understand this thing in this way, but if we go here, we switch into a different sort of mental model as well, conceptual model. So this is what I've been saying. You use different models uh, to solve different aspects. We're not trying to make a uniform model. This is one of the big things uh, in, in domain-driven design, right? We're not trying to make this large universal model where everything you need to, uh, like this huge canonical model where you need to understand everything. We try to find much smaller models that are isolated, focused on, uh, on a problem. 
So as a, an intuition building thing, I often teach people this, right? In, uh, when I train people, when I work with clients, think of it as an understandability boundary. That could be like your, it's not a pure like full definition, but it's, it's a heuristic for helping you decide, should I put these concepts together or should I separate them? Right? Can I understand this in isolation or not? Do I have to know about this other thing or does this other thing have to know about me in order to be productive? Then probably they want to be together. So let's do a bit uh, a more of an uh, elaborate example. Um, yeah, I added some links if you want sort of the, the full version of that. So imagine this warehouse management system. Right? Um, here it's conceived as three uh, modules, areas, boundaries, services, whatever. Um, the idea is, of course, stuff comes in into the warehouse. Uh, we call that inbound. It has to be sort of processed. You know, is it uh, is everything that is on the on the receipt F, uh, actually in that order? That sort of thing. Right. Um, when they're done with that, there's a handover. We give all this these goods to put away. Uh, they will put it somewhere in the warehouse on the shelves. And then at some point, well, maybe there's not really a handover here. It's more of a handover from sales probably. But sales tells outbound, well, we have an order for these and these and these goods, go order, pick them from the warehouse, package them, and, and ship them. So it's, it's a process, right? You can see this as sort of a, a long-running process. Um, and at each point, we can sort of see a handover, a separation. So this seems like a good uh, way to define our boundaries here. Right? The problem I see is that people do this early on in the project. You know, they usually don't even call it bound context, say defining the domains or something, and they stop there. That's where you get in trouble, right? You can't usually, unless you've worked in such a space or, or have a lot of experience, uh, but you can't usually know this up front very easily because you don't know yet where the complexity is going to happen. Right? Software wants to be connected. Software. Uh, that's sort of the point of it, right? Before software, if you wanted to integrate data, you had to send a letter to the archive in the other city, and they would copy some information from an index card and send it back to you. Connectivity was very expensive, slow, cumbersome. Now software can do this, and this is probably why it's been so successful in taking over the world. So let's, uh, let's see how this works, right? So when we put stuff away, we need to know where we put it, so we need to know something about locations. Uh, when, we, um, when we want to get it out again, to ship it, we also need to know where it is. Right? So the concept of the location is already a shared concept. Right? The first sort of example that we look at, there's already sort of a, a, a leaking of, of concepts. Right? These are not like modules right, that I'm trying to show. These are really sort of just concepts. And they're not really boundaries, just sort of concepts and who, is, who needs them, who knows about them, right? So these two parts that we conceived as two bounded contexts immediately turn out to have uh, some shared concepts in the, uh, when we start building them. Now, what happens, I told you this process, right? Stuff comes in, we process it, then it goes into the warehouse, we put it somewhere, and then we take it out maybe much, maybe a year later, right? However, Sometimes sales calls and says, well, um, we have an expedite. An expedite is, for example, when the customer pays more to have it shipped much faster. And we know that the goods we want to ship are coming in today. So today, our supplier will bring us the goods, and immediately we need to get them to our customer. That's, um, it would be very expensive and wasteful to first go put it all the way in the warehouse and then take it all out again. So when we have expedites, we're actually already cheating on this sort of pattern, this process that we, that we had imagined up front, right? The real world is never as clean and linear as we think it is. Uh, and especially software engineers have these sort of illusions about how how regular or linear the real world works. Right? So for expedites, we need to know about these concepts in two, two areas, and we actually skip the whole put away uh, phase. In order to be able to do that, right, we need to know something about the orders that come in. In fact, we need to know that everywhere. 
So the concept of orders is already being sort of spread around this, this code base. Um, and not just code, but conceptually, right? So in order to think about put away, in order to think about outbound, to think about exploits, we need to be able to understand what orders are. Um, now, of course, what happens? Um, well, let's stick with the example of textile distribution. Um, our clients, one of the clients is sort of saying, oh, we, um, we had some bad product delivered by you. Can you make sure we only get high quality product? OK, let's do quality control. Well, we have a few options now. Right? We can do quality control whenever stuff comes in. So first it comes in, we, we check it. Now, these are like rolls of 10 meters uh, wide, uh, well, or five, I, I, I forgot. I've seen them, but it's, it's, they're big things, right? You have to, they hire people with muscle to actually uh, manipulate those rolls. You have to put them on a thing that unrolls them and, and check for, for uh, defects in the fabric or in the coloring or whatever. Um, so we can't do this on everything that comes in. That would be way too expensive. So we can do it on like a percentage of things coming in. Let's uh, add that here, quality control. Or we can do it on the stuff that goes out, also on a percentage of it. Or we can do it specifically for customers that have been complaining a lot. Or we can do it specifically for suppliers where we have noticed that the quality isn't, used, isn't always uh, you know, up to our standard. So there's a bunch of options there. Um, in order to be able to know what will we do these checks on, we need to know something about the orders. And well, the customers are not on here, but we need to know something about that. There's actually even like customer support involved, because customer support is the one that tells us which customers are complaining a lot. Right? So you see how, the, again, more connectivity um, on top of that. So I told you they hire people for, for muscle, right? That means that uh, not everybody's really uh, skilled in, in validating the quality of these things. We don't have like dedicated quality control people. We have people who have worked in a warehouse for a long time, have handled these fabrics so often that they know what to look for, that they have experience. So we pull them away from other work. So there's maybe people doing work on... Um, on uh, in outbound, like shipping stuff, and then we tell them, well, can you take an hour and go do some quality control on this set of, uh, of things here? Uh, so we now have a staff management problem, right? So we have to assign staff to different roles. Maybe they will tell us, oh, but we're just working on this expedite. What has priority now? Right? So what you get is sort of um, boats in the, in the real world, in the physical system, warehouse managers doing these sort of small local optimizations. Oh, if you, maybe you can do that, and then you can go do that for an hour and then come back because we have the expertise. This sort of very manual sort of local optimization. Of course, this doesn't optimize for the whole system, right? This optimizes for their specific problem, and that might cause problems elsewhere, and you get conflict, et cetera, and, and sort of, you know, a strife for, uh, for, for resources and, 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 and people. Uh, so, of course, sometimes then they go to the, to the software developers and say, well, can you add a feature that gives me this and this information or that allows me to do So there's local optimizations everywhere in the software as well for dealing with these staff problems and expedites and all of that stuff. Right? So more connectivity, more sort of mixing of, of concepts. Uh, I put staff here in quality control, but um, you need it for expedites, you need it for everything, right? So you need to know who is working on what, if you want to have a chance of optimizing the system. Uh, in general, like all warehouse systems do this sort of inbound, put away outbound, but the ones that uh, do well on the market are the ones that can help you optimize on actually like reducing waste and, and running the warehouse as efficient as possible. That's where the, the profit margin is, of course. Uh, so I mentioned customer support. That's typically one of those uh, we call it a, um, an octopus context because it sort of reaches into everything. Right? Customer support needs to be able to see and do things across the whole system. Forecasting is one of those as well, maybe more on the receiving end. It needs to know about stuff, and then based on that, they can do predictions of... Uh, but it needs to know about sales, it needs to know about the market, it needs to know about uh, what's happening in the, in the warehouse. I know what you're thinking, right? You're all thinking... Matthias is shit at drawing diagrams. Well, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, but 
I call this the law of clean diagrams, right? If your system is a mess and your diagram is clean, your diagram is lying, right? The diagrams are always sort of, oh, look at these like neatly pixel perfect boxes with straight lines. Your software is not like that. If it is like that, you have no problem. I'm done. Go home, enjoy your life. Uh, more likely, it is a mess. As a corollary, um, all system diagrams are liars, of course. The map is not the territory, it's just the model. Models are wrong, it's sort of an abstraction. Is it useful? Can it help us to think about the system? Um, but I often see diagrams that simply do not help at all. They, they have this sort of beautiful illusion and they serve no purpose. So think about that, right? I'd rather see a mess where I can sort of see where the problems are, where the, um, you know, where sort of the hotspots are, where a lot of things are happening. I want to see that. I overlay a lot of things on my maps when I, when I draw them. They are a mess, but they are useful. <laughs> anyway, so the problem is we have this whole sort of heavily everything depending on everything, forecasting, quality control, customer support expedites, all of this stuff. Um, how to deal with this, right? Um, let's try and think again about what the purpose of this, this thing is. Right? We see that expedites and staff management, these sort of areas are, are touching on many different domi domains. We have a lot of local optimizations in the code and by the human, like the, the warehouse managers. So if we take this now, right? if we think, I, I told you one of the critical aspects of a good warehouse management system is can it deal with efficiency? But efficiency was not on that picture, right? There was sort of some aspects of that, but the whole, everything, you have to imagine this as, you know, everywhere in the code, in the system, there are little things that try to optimize something locally, and nobody understands how the whole thing works because you can't sort of keep the whole system in your head and it's sort of all over the place. So what if we just take this out and make that like a primary thing? Is it core domain? Maybe, but it's, it's an important aspect, right? It's, it's not really a domain, it's more of a bounded context here that we can isolate. So basically the question now becomes, can we isolate efficiency as a bounded context? Meaning, can we find all the, um, all the concepts spread across our models, etc., take them out, all the concepts that deal with making something efficient, uh, managing stuff, managing expedites, uh, and deciding on priorities between them, because that's the thing we couldn't do before, right? Because it was too spread out. Everything was deciding on their own priorities, but conflicting. If we take this out, we can now isolate this and build something that is really focused on managing priority. Uh, managing priority, managing efficiency, managing where people are at what time, doing what and what is more important, and is this expedite worth pulling someone away from other work that they are doing? Interrupting work can be expensive, but if the value of the thing we're doing instead is greater, maybe it's worth it. So it's basically something that understands this, this, this kind of thing. And the way we can then organize the rest of the code, maybe we keep this structure, I don't know, um, but now availability is something that you request to the other thing. It's, it's a great separation of, um, of concepts, right, that allows more understandability because these things, nothing else needs to understand priorities, optimizations, expedites, all these things. They don't need to know anything about it except if I want someone to do something, I need to request availability from the thing that knows, right? So it's, it's not a domain, it's not in the sense that the business said, oh, we are in the efficiency domain. They don't think about themselves as that. They, they are in the textile distribution, and of course they want efficiency, but they don't necessarily see how to do it. Um, so it's not a domain. It's something that we as designers decided, okay, what if we pull this out, isolate this stuff, and now we can optimize this in a much more global, sort of uniform way, um, and, and redesign our system that way. We didn't go the full way. If you want to know, we did some of this stuff. Um, but, uh, but it already was a, was a lot of help. Um, so efficiency is solved centrally, right? Now it's, a, now it's its own bounded context. It has its own language. Efficiency, the efficiency context knows about things like staff and expedites, but it doesn't really know about how the warehouse really works. It doesn't know what locations are or what a put away is, or it doesn't really have to know any of this stuff. 
It just knows that these types of tasks uh, get priority of these types of tasks or based on the value of the order or whatever, like we now have a centralized place. It's, it's creating optionality, right? Optionality is the ability to pick strategies um, as, you, as you wish, right? In the previous version of the system, we couldn't really, if somebody said, oh, what if we um, introduce a way to, to um, uh, pick the priority of somebody based on the order size, it would have been very hard because you don't know where the people are and, 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 and what they're doing. But if you have isolated this, now a feature like that becomes very obvious. You know where to put it, you know what it needs to talk, you know sort of where to inject it in the efficiency context. Right, so it, it creates optionality. It, it gives us a place where we don't know what the best, what sort of optimizations we want to do in the future. But because it's isolated, we know that if we want to do optimizations, we will be able to do it. Right? That's optionality. We don't know what we need yet, but we know that if we need it, we will be able to do it. Right? That gives us the choice of trying different things. That as well, right? Experiments become a lot cheaper. Because it's isolated now, I can quickly sort of do a simulation in this efficiency context, a, a, a quick proof of concept of what if I do this based on order size, what does it look like? I can just like hack together some code, try it, get rid of it again, and then maybe do a real project about it. Before, if somebody had said, can we prioritize based on order size, we would have said, well, that would probably, it, the system isn't designed for that, it would probably take six months to do that. Oh, never mind, right? The idea is dropped. It's just forgotten about. Oh, it's not possible, right? We're not an organization that can do these kind of things. We're not, we don't have this sort of uh, abilities. Uh, this capability. Now that it's isolated, somebody says, hey, what if we prioritize on order size? Oh yeah, let me do a quick proof of concept. Let's meet again tomorrow. Or yeah, this, this is what it would work like. It's feasible. It will probably take two weeks to build. Okay, let's just do it. And they, and they just do it, and now they have it, right? And half a year later, they decide, that, oh, maybe it's really not that good as we thought. We get rid of it again. It's easy to get rid of because it's nicely isolated. Right? So, Again, optionality, uh, the ability to experiment. In the same six months, we have already built the feature and tried it for six months, as opposed to spend a lot of effort building it and then it doesn't work and then you're sort of stuck with it and this sort of... Uh... So, um, yeah, I talked about this. Uh, it, it compares urgency of, uh, of requests. So, yeah, maybe this point, it's uh, theory of constraints. If you read uh, Goldratt, um, uh, it's the, the theory of how you know bottlenecks in a in a in a system have to be handled, etc. So it's not just that we isolate this bounded context; we can have actual you know theory and philosophy behind it that we didn't sort of invent from scratch. It's not just local optimizations by people sort of not really understanding how efficiency works at scale. It's based, you, we can base it on theory. That was like a nice um, you know, side effect of this, I, I guess. So the purpose of the system is rethought. It's really about purpose, right? It's not sort of technical boundaries or other constraints. It's we think about purpose, we think about what's important, and then the structure, the design of the system follows that. We could do the same for other areas as well, like locations. I think that's a more obvious one where um, there's a central bounded context managing locations of things. Um, again, the business doesn't think in we have a locations domain, right? It's not, we're a text, like if, if you ask the CEO, draw your company, the domains of your company, they probably wouldn't say locations is a domain. But it's a, a set of things that we choose to isolate. There may be another set of things that are better choice. Maybe there's other designs that are better. That's, that sort of knowledge is emergent, right? It's, it's working on the system, playing around with it, sort of seeing the, the problems you have paying attention to the feature requests you get, and especially the ones you don't do, because they're too hard. Those are signals, right? Those are things that point you in the direction of, hey, what if this could be pulled out? Or what if this could be separate? Or what if this could be merged? Maybe some things are separate, but they are so chatty, they talk so much to each other that they're better served together. Am I making sense so far? Yeah? Excellent. I have another example. Um, this is from my uh, co-author, Rebecca Wersbrock. Uh, she was invited to um, consult for a company 
that did uh, trading, financial trading. And uh, the company basically had about 20 commodities trading, traders. Um, and they had a team of about 30 software engineers. And, um, and they had called her in because they wanted some help with, uh, well, back in the days that was called uh, object design. Uh, we would probably call it domain modeling now. Um, but um, the idea was they had uh, sort of a shared system, but that was quite thin. But they had like a separate system for each of the traders. So they had 20 bounded contexts for the same subdomain for managing trading. Right? So they asked her to help them because they felt it was very wasteful and, um, and very, uh, you know, like they were doing things that probably make you cringe. For example, they would, um, a trader would ask something, they would, the engineers would go talk to other engineers and say, have you done something like this? Oh yeah, I've done this and this. Okay, let me just copy that code into my code base. Right? You think this is cringy. After a while working with these people, Rebecca came to the conclusion that actually this was the optimal way. Because the, the variability between what the traders were asking, right? They each had sort of, uh, you have to know in, in trading, the traders are sort of sacred, right? They, they, like everything needs to work for them. You don't disturb them. You make sure they have everything they need. If they want to do it a certain way, you give it to them, right? They are the, the rainmakers, right? They bring in the money. So um, she came to the conclusion that this was optimal because they had all these sort of small needs. If this organization had tried to build one system for that, one bounded context that was shared and that had maybe configuration options for every trader, etc., they would have to coordinate a lot more. They would have to have meetings agreeing about, well, my trader asked for this. Can we build this? Well, that would conflict with what my trader is doing. So we need to build a way that we can configure this individually. This is all a lot of extra work that in this environment did not make sense. In this environment specifically, right? I'm not telling you, like, don't go back to your, uh, to your team and say, Matthias has said we have to split everything and duplicate all our bound context and copy code back and forth. Please don't. But consider that there are valid reasons to do this. Right? Again, this is, to me, this is like the best evidence that bounded contexts are not domains. Because for one domain, I can have 20 bounded contexts that each do things slightly different, that have their own model, their own language, their own sort of set of concepts. There's, some similar, there's a lot of similarity, of course. Um, but it's, it's not this sort of naive thing that we do where we draw our domains and then, okay, these are our bounded context done. That's what I'm trying to argue against here, right? That's not very helpful because the domains are not there to serve the structure, the organization, the design of the, of the software system. They are there for a reason, but we have other concerns to deal with, right? We have to design it in a way that works for us. So here, this was optimal. Of course, maybe if they had started from a shared system, but even then, I think, based on, on what Rebecca told me, um, I think she was absolutely right that it, it would have been... So she might even have advised if it was one system, like just fork it 20 times and allow them to evolve on their own because you will reduce the amount of coordination. You get more autonomy. Uh, autonomy is not always the holy grail that some people make it out to be, but in this case, because the traders are autonomous, the software, si the software engineers are mostly autonomous, the system itself consists of 20 autonomous parts. It's sort of mimicking the structure of how the domain works in favor of the domain, right? That's sort of what I want you to, to, to think about. Um, this is sort of an extreme example. But I've done this sort of thing, um, uh, for example, a company that, uh, well, the domain doesn't matter, but they were in different markets. They had uh, onboarding processes that were highly regulated. They had to know things about the customer, uh, but it was different in different countries. Um, and so we decided in the end to have one bounded context per country uh, for 
just for onboarding, right? So it's not that the whole system was duplicated 20 times or whatever, but the onboarding process had basically the same input and output, right? Onboard this customer, and then this customer is onboarded. That's sort of the, the input and the output of, of the whole process. But the process itself was completely separated. It had its own concepts and model and design, and it was using sort of you know, its own code base. It was very separate. Another example is this. If you acquire a competitor in your same sort of market, now you have two ordering bounded contexts and two sales bound contexts and two shipping bounded contexts and two. So this is normal, right? And then, of course, you have to make a design choice. Do we merge them? Do we keep one and drop the other? Do we keep them both? That might make sense. Um, that sort of thing. But these are design choices, right? Well, they're often inspired by budget, but still it's a design choice. And of course, when companies acquire another, they have this illusion that, oh, we will just sort of optimize by getting rid of half the things and now we and move everything over, push the button, and now we're uh, in business at half the cost. It doesn't work that way most of the time, but uh, all right. Still with me? Yes, excellent. I have another example, which is again back more at, at code level. Um, so sort of a, a, a last minute idea to add it here. I wrote the long version, uh, is, in, is in there as well. So maybe you've seen this pattern. It's a, two value objects. They represent money. They have an amount. Uh, it's not really on this picture, but it does things like, um, so money, for example, euro has uh, two decimals. Um, it deals with that, right? So the, it, it, it knows these constraints. It handles them. So your, your money object is always a valid money object. There's no such thing as an invalid money object. It has its validations, etc., cetera, to, uh, to prevent that. You probably, well, if you're in DDD, you've probably sort of seen this, this pattern, right? Um, now, let's say, well, it doesn't really matter what the domain is here, but uh, in some domains, you need much higher precision when dealing with money. You need to calculate up to, well, gas stations, for example, have three decimals. Uh, in trading, sometimes you have four or even eight decimals. Um, there are domains that need this, basically. So what do we do? We could relax the constraint on this money object and say, well, from now on, it can actually deal with this higher precision. And we can add, um, we can add a, a, a round method so that we can round it down when we need to do, when we just need the two decimals, right? Um, so the, there's weaknesses in that, right? There's, there's problems with that. First of all, uh, so we need, we need to round, when do we need to round down? Probably when we need to pay something or settle something or, you know, when actually money changes hands, the two decimals make sense. As long as it's inside our system, we don't have to have two decimals. We can have as many as we choose. Right? That's sort of the, the general idea. But it has problems, right? Because it's very implicit. We don't know when we have a money object, is this now a rounded one or a, or a high precision one? Right? That's not clear from the model. It's sort of implicit. So I always look for these kind of things. What is, what is hiding? What is not uh, explicit? Um, this, this example is inspired by a system I worked on where um, money was being um, calculated and then rounded, and then other calculations happened with the money, and then it was being rounded again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It wasn't even using value objects, right? It was just uh, plain scalars. But um, we did some calculation, and we figured out that the system was losing about 6,000 euros a month due to rounding errors. Um, and I proposed to fix that, and they didn't care enough about it, and I proposed to fix it and then uh, for free in my spare time and get the 6,000 euros a month, but that, uh, that also didn't fly, of course. No, uh, seriously, though, it, I, I started looking for, for ways to solve this, right? And so one pattern here is that you can actually just separate on the explicit thing, right? We can say, well, this money is precise. Here we care about that. Uh, here we don't have the constraint of two decimals. Here we, we calculate with the higher precision, etc. And then when we need to do payments or anything, or settlement, we will round it down, and we will have an explicit type called rounded money. And rounded money cannot be used in the, in the calculations 
where we are expecting precise money. Right? So we use the type system to cleanly separate these two concepts, make sure they don't mix, and we are always very certain about what is precise money, what is rounded money. Right? Making sense? Um, do you see more weaknesses here? Yes? So if you compare two amounts of rounded money, you get a Boolean that is now also rounded, right? Uh, if you compare two, then you get a Boolean, but the Boolean is rounded? Well, the Boolean is affected by the rounding, right? The round, I'm sorry, yes, the, yes, round, yes. the rounding might change from true to false, might, tr might change the result of the comparison from true to false. So this kind of, there's kind of contagion to other objects other than money. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry if I didn't say what you expected. But. That's not what I'm looking for. No, I'm, I'm at, of course, we're talking about bounded context, right? So purpose, right? That's what I'm looking for here. Uh, this model of precise money and, and rounded money, it's, it's sort of still engineering-centric, right? It talks about what it is. It solves the problem technically, but not logically, not at the level of, of language and understandability. Um, it doesn't say what it is for. So the, what's missing here is the idea of, of bounded context, that when we are calculating things, when we are doing trading, when we are calculating gas price, etc., we are really in a different space, in a different context than when we are paying people. That's what I'm looking for here. Right? So we don't actually need that language of rounded money and precise money. Another weakness is that rounded money and precise money are not terms that I've ever heard a domain expert say. They don't use these terms. Right? Not in that way, at least. That's, that's always a, a smell, right? That makes me look for, is there something hidden here? So, if we treat this, if we say, well, actually, these are just two bounded contexts, they each work differently. They have a different purpose. They have different rules. So I have two separate models of money now. Of course, uh, they're not the same model, right? They work differently. One is high precision. The other is, is rounded, serves for, for, for payments. There's things that we're not going to be able to do on one side that we can do on the other side, etc. But they don't really have to share that, like, if you, if you add prefixes to the language in your code, that's often a smell that you're inventing language because you're trying to build a model that's too big. They both call it, both these areas would call it just money, right? So the, the smell is that they are just different areas and that we can isolate on that axis. Of course, there's still some sort of communication where it needs to be rounded to go to the other context, etc. cetera. Um, that's all very solvable. Uh, but the idea is that now we think of these things in isolation. When we talk about money in one context, we know, uh, okay, this is precise. When we talk in the other context, we know this is, um, and this is rounded uh, for payments. Make sense? So that's what I'm looking for, right? Bound the context for the business need, for the software need as well, like what makes it easy for us to keep developing, to do experiments, to do you know, fast changes, to do proof of concepts, um, to, uh, to really understand this, to onboard new engineers really quickly into this domain if we manage uh, understandability using... The, I think, like that's, that's the main, I think, invention of, of domain-driven design, right? That we're not just talking about code and systems and deployable units and these kind of boundaries, that we're not just talking, talking about technical boundaries, that we're not just talking about domain boundaries, but that we're thinking in language boundaries, in conceptual boundaries, which may cross multiple systems or not, right? That we, that we try to um, unify this language in the bound context, but at different levels. So code, documentation, conversations, diagrams, user interface. It's one sort of shared model. Um, and that's the whole, the whole idea, right? And not just superficial domain boundaries. Um, I've said in the past that uh, maybe DDD should have been called uh, Boundary Aware Design, but the acronym is bad. <laughs> he got it. Um, so, efficiency, bound context is not a domain, it's, a, it's not a part of how the problem was explained to us, right? There's this, this other sort of naivete in, in, in domain driven design, that the domain expert comes, they know everything, they will tell us, and all we have to do, our job, is capture the domain. That's not it. That's not modeling. That's just capturing facts, right? But modeling is, is making choices, is finding abstractions, is understanding if the abstractions actually are valuable to us or will hinder us. A lot of abstractions are actually more, uh, you know, 
are not helpful at all to understand and even make it worse to try to understand the system. So abstraction, not for the sake of, oh, it's good software design, abstraction for the sake of understandability. Um, we decide that the new model has to be internally consistent, self-contained, decoupled. Um, yeah, I think I talked about all of this. It's a consistent model and language. The boundary is explicit, right? Maybe that's a, a point I should make a bit more. You don't really have accidental bounded context. Uh, you have in the sense that language is very social, right? If a group of people works together on a shared problem, they will evolve a local language that serves their needs, right? Um, it's, it's, uh, they will use terms and attribute meaning to them that works for them. Uh, they will adapt words and give them different meaning because it works in their environment. Uh, or sometimes they will just use words and sort of forget the original meaning or, or they keep using them because they have been using them but the meaning has shifted. All these sort of things happen in natural language, right? Natural language is very much undesigned. What we do in, in domain-driven design, ubiquitous language, it's not a domain language, right? It's a design language. Same idea here, right? It's not we capture the language of the business, it's we design a language that serves our needs and serves the needs of the business, that is, of course, highly inspired by the language of the business. But it's not just capturing, right? It's a, it's a more formal language. DDD is formalizing the organic social, natural language that the domain uses into something more structured. Why? Because we need it for software design. Software is quite unforgiving when it comes to language, right? Even a misplaced comma will uh, crash your code. Um, so we need a bit more formality. How formal depends on the context, right? If I'm a, if I'm a small startup uh, trying something new in, an, in a new domain, we probably don't have a lot of formality, but we have a bit more formality than just the spoken language, right? Because we put it in code, we put it maybe in some documentation. If I'm designing the next HTTP spec, I have to be extremely formal, right? We have uh, RFCs, etc. That's sort of uh, the most formal version of a ubiquitous language. HTTP is a ubiquitous language for uh, data exchange, right, or message exchange, that's how you can think of it. So it's very formal, and it has to be because it's, of course, uh, very widely used. Um, and then uh, everything in between, right? If you're doing something for, I worked on um, software for uh, medical devices, for, uh, you know, uh, administering dosages of, uh, of chemo, that's very dangerous, you have to be very precise, you need a lot more formality uh, in your language. Um, so I talked about this, uh, you know, context, uh, separating context works both ways. Uh, if you pull something out, it's not just that the new thing is easier to understand, but also the old things are easier to understand because more concepts have been removed, right? And, well, Eric Evans uh, advised this as well in the book, right? Try to really distill your business critical essential things to the, to the essence of it take away as much sort of unneeded language uh, as you can, isolate it. Maybe those extracted subdomains don't have to be as well designed as, uh, as the core. They're not as critical. Um, of course, they need to work well, etc. But And also this might shift, right? Your core domain today might not be your core domain tomorrow. So maybe the subdomain you extracted, when you feel it gets more important, then put more effort in modeling and, and language and, uh, and optimizing. Right. Of course, this doesn't work if your entire engineering culture is incremental, right? It's append only. Well, not just engineering culture, Agile sort of enabled that a bit too much, that software design is just define some task, work on them for two weeks, and then add the next thing and the next thing, and there's sort of no thinking about the bigger design. And uh, so it goes very fast in the beginning, and then it slows down because understandability goes down, progress goes down, etc. And at every point, that's the... Maybe my final point here, uh, this sort of work is costly, right? Like rethinking your design, remodeling, rethinking about language, pulling things out, like this works, but we're still going to work on this and pull this out and separate it. A lot of people will tell you, oh, Yagni, or there's no value, or this other stuff is more important. At every point, it will be cheaper to add something new 
then do first, refactor it, and then add the new thing. It just is, right? Um, so the incentive is never to first improve it and then uh, add the new thing. So that's why we have this effect. Right? Another model for this is uh, Carlo Pesio talks about the physics of software. He calls this gravity. Your first line of code, uh, you write your first line, and then you write your second line, it's close to the first line. Right? So this is now acquiring more mass. The next line is going to be close to your... The, the next function is going to be close to your first function. Right? So it, it, the more mass the software has, the more it attracts new code to be added to that. And it becomes harder and harder to escape that gravity. Right? So splitting becomes more and more expensive over time. So at every point, like even though adding stuff also becomes more expensive because you don't know where to add it, you have to understand it, you have to read a lot of stuff first and sort of reverse engineer the code to understand where to add it. Um, at that point, it's still cheaper to just do that and add it. But the next thing will also be more expensive. So it's sort of this you know, race to the bottom um, and then we have these horrible systems that we all uh, probably don't like working on. But the opposite also works. That's the beauty of it. If you do this work, if you do this separation, if you think about, does this belong together? Do we need to understand this together? Um, you get a compound effect. Right? So this, I already had some examples, right? If we pull out this efficiency context, we can now more easily do experiments, proof of concepts, that sort of thing, right? Add some new features to the efficiency thing. That's compound effect, right? If we then, in the efficiency thing, discover, well, we're sort of doing two things here, maybe they can be separated. Extra work, sure, but, oh, sorry, that's my timer. <laughs> um, I forgot the sound was on. But uh, <laughs> I'm finished anyway. So uh, it's extra work, but, we create optionality, right? That's the compound effect. We, we will be in situations where we will need to change things, where we get new requirements, where the, the market shifts, or there's new technology, right? This has happened over and over, right? Now it's, it's AI, but at some point it was mobile, and suddenly all these highly coupled apps where the user interface and the logic were all sort of mixed together, people were now struggling to make mobile apps because they couldn't just, they didn't have a separation of logic and, and presentation. So it was very expensive to build mobile apps. Now if you start with a separation of your domain logic and your user interface, you can just add more user interfaces or replace the user interface, etc. So it's very valuable. It pays off in the long term. It's very hard to explain this to people who have not experienced this. That's the problem. So you have to keep raising awareness for that effect. You have to keep showing people. Like engineers, we sometimes believe that this is a problem. I found a solution, I show this solution to people, and now everybody adopts it. That's how we see the world. In reality, people need to be made aware. In, in marketing, they know it better, right? They say you need seven contact points before making a buying decision on average, right? So create awareness, do marketing for these ideas, right? That's the only way you will get people to sort of buy in and, uh, and see the value. Make use cases, right? Show here we did this, and this is the benefits we are getting, right? It's more stable, we have fewer regressions, we, we do story points faster, whatever they care about, right? Just make sure you show that you're getting those benefits and you will get more, more buy-in, right? Find something small maybe to start on, build trust, uh, etc. Thank you very much. Come uh, to DD Europe in May. Um, if you like this stuff, read the book that Rebecca and I are writing. We're still adding new essays. Um, and uh, thank you very much.